Did you know that your favorite dinosaur very well could be the result of a war? If you had a passion for dino nuggies and the land before time as a child, you very well could know about Cope and Marsh, about their epic battle in the American West. But how much do you really know about their battle, about what caused it, and about what we can learn about paleontology? Berlin, Germany. Two American paleontologists walk into a bar. The bartender says, In the midst of the Civil War, graduate student Othniel Charles Marsh, just Marsh for short, was studying in Berlin, the University of Berlin, after excelling greatly in his studies at Yale. At the same time, Edward Drinker Cope, or just Cope for short, his father sent him to Europe abroad in Berlin in 1863 to avoid being drafted into the Civil War. The men were functionally two sides of the same very, very hard-headed coin. Marsh, born Othniel Charles Marsh in October 29, 1831, was only nine years the junior of the term paleontology itself. Growing up, he only had his father after his mother had died when he was three years old. His father wanted Marsh to be a strong farmhand, and due to financial constraints, he couldn't really afford to give Marsh a proper education. Marsh, on the other hand, from a very young age, started hunting for fossils. He felt very drawn to academia, and luckily he had a wealthy uncle that was willing to help him out and to fund his education. With the support of that uncle, he was able to go to high school, to go to Phillips Academy, to go to Yale, and eventually to the University of Berlin. Cope, born Edward Drinker Cope, was nine years Marsh's junior. Born in July 28, 1840, Cope was born into a very wealthy family. Due to the financial support in his endeavors, Edward, from a young age, was able to, to, to turn his childhood passion to science into a career, into studying, into publishing articles. Although occasionally getting bad grades or bad marks, for his attitude, he was undeniably very smart and had a lot of discoveries under his belt from a very young age. He turned that passion into studying at the University of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, and in 1863, to avoid the Civil War draft, his father sent him abroad to Germany. Their relationship in Germany started out great. They were friends, although that's sort of debated on how much of that was real friendship and how much of that was just networking, but they respected each other's discoveries and they respected each other's love for science. After returning to the United States, the two men were still very friendly with each other. Cope naming Petinius Marshy, a salamander fossil, after Marsh, and in return, Marsh naming Mosasaurus Copanus after his soon-to-be arrival. In 1868, Cope had published an article about a reconstruction that he had done on Elasmosaurus. After already publishing this article, he invited Marsh to come take a look. Marsh, upon seeing the specimen, noticed that the head that was supposed to be on the long neck side of the Elasmosaurus was instead on the short tail end of the Elasmosaurus. Cope was furious. He refused to accept that he could have made such a mistake and so they called upon his mentor. Joseph Leidy would then agree with Marsh and correct him on the mistake. Cope was humiliated, he was angry, and in his attempt to rectify the mistake, he tried to buy back every article that he published, to erase it from the record and make sure that nobody could call back upon this mistake and use it to discredit his reputation. Unfortunately, this didn't work. Um, there were already buyers of the article, including Joseph Leidy himself. So in the end, his buyback of all the articles and his fight to avoid his humiliation really did nothing to help his reputation, in fact, only made him seem a little bit shadier. But make no mistake, shadiness will not be something that is only a part of Cope's character. Marsh later wrote of the incident, when I informed Professor Cope of it, his wounded vanity received a shock from which it has never recovered and has since been my bitter enemy. Now, at the same time that that was happening, Cope had shown Marsh a fossil bed, one in New Jersey, and behind Cope's back, after being granted the kindness of seeing this, he ordered, bribed, for all of the fossils to be sent to his personal address. Very shady. These events were the catalyst for the Bone Wars. Marsh, with his higher academic connections, would head westward to collect more fossils. Cope would soon follow. This led to just an all-out war. Dynamites, espionage, bribery, spies, sabotage, anything you can imagine they were doing. So. Before we get ahead of ourselves, in the 1870s, the two men would begin their pride-filled expedition west. Marsh was completely dedicated to his cause. 
his cause being discovering and naming as many fossils as he could, more than Cope. He viewed Cope as competition and therefore needed spies, needed to monitor him to make sure that he wasn't finding better fossils than him. The sabotage was was fully out of his own greed and pride. In his spying, Marsh even gave Cope a code name. It was Jones. Marsh, however, was not the only one who viewed this as an act of competition. Cope would buy out the American Naturalist Journal to try to publish and produce as many articles as fast as he could. Both of these men valuing quantity over quality when it came to these articles. Have you ever heard somebody go, um, actually, Brontosaurus isn't a real dinosaur. You can blame these guys for that. In one year alone, 1879 to 1880, Cope published 76 papers. In a short few years, the number of known dinosaur species absolutely skyrocketed, but many of those species now were under debate or revoked. Uh, that's what we're gonna be covering in later videos. I published almost 80 papers in one year. I'm gonna put this clown out of business. Marsh, more determined than ever to put Cope out of business, uh, secured the spot of head paleontologist at the U.S. Geological Survey. This gave Marsh even more connections, even more funding, even more industry power than he had before. He quickly made it his mission to cut Cope off of government funding. Cope, as a result, desperate for money to continue his expeditions, tried to break into the silver mining trade. This failed. It caused him to lose nearly everything, and by 1890, he was separated by, from his wife. Yeesh. The only thing Cope had left was his extensive fossil collection. <laughs> and I'm not finished with you yet! Marsh, not understanding the concept of don't kick them while they're down, saw this, saw his fossil collection was the last thing he had left, and tried to come for that too. He claimed that Cope had used government funding, and therefore these should not be in his personal collection. And for Cope, this was the last straw. Marsh had gone too far. Cope had been collecting records of Marsh's shady behavior, of his mistakes, of his embarrassments, of everything that Marsh had done over the years he had been collecting, recording, and he turned this over to the New York Herald. The New York Herald then dropped a bombshell article titled, Scientists Wage Bitter Warfare. This caused an all-out civil war within the American scientific community. It was an embarrassment for the U.S. government that Marsh had been doing this with their funding, that Marsh was holding such a high position. It was an embarrassment for the entirety of American paleontology that these two were running around, destroying fossils, threatening people with violence, using dynamite to get what they wanted. It also put corruption in the U.S. Geological Survey on a national stage. This resulted in Congress investigating and not only erasing Marsh's position of, as head paleontologist of the U.S. Ge Geological Survey, but also cutting the program entirely. But he wasn't done, and that wasn't all. Marsh was then ordered to relinquish a huge portion of his personal fossil collection, which he had acquired through government funding. Whoops. Neither man's reputation or finances ever really recovered from their battle and their love of public slander and uh, dynamite. Cope struggled to find a buyer for his beloved collection, later selling a portion for $32,000, which is around a million and a quarter dollars in today's money. He would then, in 1867, fall ill and pass away at the age of 56. Marsh, just two years later, died of pneumonia at the age of 67. He passed away with just $186 in his bank account, which is around 7000 today. He also had over 80 tons of his collection acquired by the Smithsonian. So who really won the Bone Wars? If we're going strictly by numbers, Cope discovered 56 new species during their battle while Marsh discovered 80. But before we get ahead of ourselves again, we are, in fact, ignoring my favorite part of this entire petty feud, the best part of all. Cope, in his death, left for Marsh a final challenge, a final competition. Cope would donate his brain to science, calling for Marsh to do the same so that their brains could be measured <laughs> and they could see once and for all who had the biggest brain. <laughs> Now, 
as funny as that is by itself. Marsh did not comply. And on top of that, Cope's brain, still preserved at the University of Philadelphia, is rumored to not even be his own. So, who won the Bone Wars? Well, not American paleontology, but at the same time, kind of American paleontology. Some of the most famous dinosaurs ever were discovered during this time. My favorite of all time, Allosaurus, was discovered during the Bone Wars. Triceratops was discovered during the Bone Wars. So many dinosaurs were discovered, but so many were lost. There was so much destruction. So many bones were destroyed. Not only were these bones destroyed unintentionally as fodder for their feud, there were also fossils that were destroyed on purpose to get rid of so the other couldn't have them. All of these things we can never get back. They're gone. They were destroyed and they're gone forever. So in the next videos on the Bone Wars, I'm going to be covering dinosaurs that were either fabricated or misidentified during the Bone Wars and all of the pieces that modern paleontologists have had to pick up in their wake. Both men were undeniably passionate about paleontology. Actually, Marsh was one of the first paleontologists to suggest that birds were descended from dinosaurs, but their pride, their greed, and their methods of rushed production and rushed discovery was a huge detriment. And I think that as scientists, as people, and as friends, we can all learn something from that. Also, their battle brought so much positive attention to dinosaurs. I probably wouldn't be sitting behind all these toy dinosaurs had this not happened, had the dinosaur craze not started, had the bone wars not happened. So like everything in history, the bone wars were really not that black and white. There wasn't a winner or a loser, except for maybe us. What we won was dinosaurs and getting to look at this history in hindsight. So thank you guys so much for watching and I can't wait to move forward with more videos about this. Also, uh, Allosaurus is the best dinosaur ever to ever exist. There's never been a better dinosaur than Allosaurus. Allosaurus is the greatest, bye.